Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to April's non-farm, Friday the 1st of April's non-farm payrolls webinar, fourth one of 2016 and the first one of the new quarter. I'm not really too sure how much um, influence this will have on the direction of the dollar, given some of the comments out of Janet Yellen earlier this week. But before I get started, I have to flag up the obligatory risk warning for all the regions. So we have the UK risk warning coming up right now. So videos for general information not intended to provide trading or investment advice or any personal recommendations, so on and so forth. So um, then we have the... the uh, the other one for um, the other regions. And finally, the one for Canada and my colleague in Canada, Colin Szynski, who will be co-hosting this webinar with me. And good morning, everyone. Uh, and good morning. And hopefully we will be able to shed some light on the overall direction of the dollar, which to all intents and purposes, I think, Colin, is I think markets are still um, longer dollars. I think that's the overall impression that I get, certainly looking at the client sentiment indicators for our, on, our, um, mm -hmm. on our major currencies. Euro dollar um, is predominantly short euros. We can sort of see that, despite the fact that, um, despite the, fact that um, the market has broken higher. But I think, first and foremost, before we start digging into the currencies, I think we need to start talking about expectations for the payrolls numbers in just under 15 minutes' time. And Sounds great. Let, let's, let's, let's start with the actual headline number, because I think, to all intents and purposes, the headline number is probably not as important as the wages number. Uh, agreed. And, and the street is expecting 200,000. And what we're really looking at now, uh, and, and we've seen for a good part of this year, and, and what we're getting from the Fed speakers is that they, they've all come back to around two interest rate increases this year. And that's become the party line we've seen. Does, uh, uh, Secretary Yellen spoke to that earlier in the week. Uh, she's knocked down those uh, members last week who were calling for three. And, and at the same time, we've seen some of the doves at the Fed also moving towards two rate hikes for this year. So we saw that from uh, Evans of the Chicago Fed and Dudley of the New York Fed. They're, they're of the more dovish members. They've kind of, they're all kind of starting to gravitate around two rate hikes. So with that being said, then, while we look for non-firm payrolls, is there anything to move it off of that? And really, it looks like we'll probably hit somewhere in the sweet spot again of uh, they're looking around 200,000 so enough that uh, people don't freak out and start worrying about a U.S. recession but not so strong that people start worrying that the Fed might have to start raising rates faster so the streets at about 200 if we give a range of about 100 around that within with you'd really have to be below 100,000 or above 300,000 to really make any kind of an impact on on Fed expectations uh, I was well, I've been calling for here. sorry and these are here, the Fed expectations in front of you, or the market expectations, I should say. Right. So we had 242k last month. The street's looking for 205,000 this month. Uh, I put my for myself. I went a little bit more bullish because I saw that the uh, ADP was a little bit above expectations. So I put called for 220. I also think that 242 will get revised downward about 10k or so. And you're a little bit lower than me, Michael. I am. I'm looking around about 160k on non-farm payrolls, and my reasoning behind that is, I think, because of the milder weather in February, a lot of um, new hires in February got brought forward from March, and I think, and I think that could well be reflected in not only the downward revision but also uh, the fact that March generally tends to disappoint to the downside in any case. So. Um, well, the markets, this, this, is, this is a screen which I find quite useful. It's called WIRP, WERP, World Interest Rate Probability. And markets are assigning a 2% probability that we'll get a hike in April, a 21% probability that we'll get a hike in June. So really the markets are assigning around about a 50% likelihood that we'll get one rate hike this year. Um, so that suggests to me that really it's not the non-farm payrolls numbers that are, we're going to be focusing on. It's the these numbers here. It's the wages numbers. And mm -hmm. last month in February, after a very decent January number of 0.5, 
we got a decline of minus 0.1. And that was a real surprise to me. Well, it wasn't so much of a surprise to me. I thought that February would be weaker. I was just surprised at how much weaker it actually was. Because in 2015, in January, we got a very decent month-on-month -month number for U.S. average hourly earnings of 0.6. And that was as a result of minimum wage increases in the number of U.S. states. The same thing happened in January this year. We got a bump of 0.5, and yen in February we got a significant slowdown as a result of that, as the average earnings or the minimum wage bump um, rolled off. And, you know, and I, think, I think this is the concern. I think the wage growth that we're seeing is coming in at the lower end of the scale, and those high-end manufacturing jobs that um, we found that um, we, we've lost over the course of the past year or so are being replaced by slightly lower skilled, lower lower salary type services jobs and that's why I think wage growth is actually as weak as it is and I see no evidence whatsoever that that's likely to turn around anytime soon now I know well, that's I think, right. yeah I think, especially on, with the uh Oh, sorry. Especially with the oil patch, with the uh, with the big crash in in oil. I mean, oh, those were a lot of really high-paying jobs that were lost in the oil patch, and they're getting replaced at a at a much lower rate. And the other reason why this is important is because one of the questions we've had now that the oil price has started to come back is, and we've seen some of the other inflation measures creep higher, like the core PCE rate, uh, is is the Fed falling behind the curve on inflation? Yellen thinks no. It's I think it's iffy. And uh, but if oil keeps going up, then maybe they do. But these wage wage pressures will be very important in, in signaling that. Are we seeing wage pressures rise? If they are, that suggests more uh, more pressure on the Fed to raise rates sooner. If wages stay stay um, subdued, then there's not as much pressure on the Fed to raise rates anytime soon, which uh, which would keep them on track for a hike maybe in uh, in June and December. And I think that's really the timing. I think markets are looking at the rest of this year, and they're ignoring the fact that there's a presidential election taking place. And I think after June, the Fed will find it very, very difficult to even contemplate a rise in rates in the heat of a presidential campaign. The last thing the Fed will want to be accused of is being partisan. And if they don't go in June, then I think it's unlikely they'll go at all. Um, they may go at the end of the, the end of the year, just before Christmas, like as they did last year, as they, like they did last year. But I think that's very much an outlier. And I think. I think it also depends on who's on the presidential ticket. You know, you, mm -hmm. the likelihood is you're going to get Donald Trump on the Republican side, potentially Hillary Clinton on the Democrat side, but there's still that concern that Ms. Mrs. Clinton could get indicted as a result of these emails, and we could end up with a uh, Trump Sanders runoff. And either one of those options is not a particularly great one for the U.S. economy. And I think if that happens, Either way, it's going to be very, very difficult to buy dollars against that sort of political backdrop, simply because of the positioning as well. I think a lot of people are positioned for U.S. rate rises, and at the moment, we're seeing that, that trade getting squeezed, particularly against the euro and particularly mm -hmm. against the dollar-yen. Um, but before we start on that, let's qu have a quick look at the S&P 500, because I think what we need to establish here is what's the potential upside, because we are getting a significant amount of divergence between U.S. markets and European markets. European markets are moving lower. U.S. markets are st uh, uh, pretty much near the highs of the year. And the reason for that, I think, is a weaker dollar and a stronger euro. The stronger euro is pushing down on European markets and it's pushing up US markets. So I think with respect to this double bottom breakout here, we still have potentially a little bit more upside in US markets around 2080 and potentially to this trend line here from the highs last year. Yes, and because one of the things we're seeing as the U.S. dollar starts to weaken is one of the biggest complaints we've had from U.S. corporations, it's something to watch as we move into earnings season, although this quarter will probably be too early, is the forex impact on, on U.S. earnings, which has been uh, has been negative for the last year, and a lot of companies have, have come out and stated it's had a huge negative impact on their earnings. As this pressure starts to come off of U.S. corporate earnings, some of the earnings expectations may start to rebound in the coming months, although I think this quarter quarterly round is going to be too soon. I think that we'll see that more of that in the uh, in the next round of reports in July. I think another factor playing into my reasoning here with respect to why I think certainly equity markets are slightly biased to the downside is not only the fact that we did get a breakout in the US 30 above 
um, a very long term resistance line. We haven't seen a similar breakout in the S&P or the Russell 2000, which makes me suspicious of this, this up move. I mean, yeah, we have moved quite considerably higher over the course of um, the last few weeks since those February highs, and we got a very nice bullish reversal here at the, at the, in the middle of February, which did suggest that we were going to get a bit of a rebound. But um, certainly all the other indicators that, that we, we're looking at, certainly with respect to um, the markets in Europe, suggest that we have broken to the downside with respect to the German DAX. There's a nice little break there, and we've broken that today. The 10,120 level has been a significant cap on the DAX, so we could get a pullback to there. But overall, the direction of travel does appear to suggest that we're going to probably head back to this support level here, particularly, I think, if the euro continues to gain. And certainly that does appear to be the case because we've seen a breakout, not only in the euro against the dollar, but also the euro against the pound. Let's look at this chart here very, very quickly. We've got four minutes to go. But we've broken above the 200-week moving average in euro sterling for the first time since um, the end of 2013. More importantly, I think we're still on course to meet this target from this breakout pattern here, potential double bottom breakout, which we saw at the beginning of the year, and we could well head towards around about 80, 74, 80, 75. So that's potentially very positive for euro sterling. We could certainly go a lot higher there. Not only that, we're doing the same sort of thing in euro yen as well, pushing higher on an uptrend from the lows that we saw at the end of February, beginning of March. If you buy into the narrative that dollar yen is weak, then ultimately there's only really one way that euro yen can sustain this particular up move and that's for euro dollar to go higher. Not going to be good news for Mario Draghi, not going to be good news for the fact they've started their corporate bond buying program today. The fact of the matter is the market doesn't really believe that the, Euro the, the European Central Bank can do much more. They think that it's pushing on a string. There is a little bit of resistance here around about current levels, which could pull us back towards these lows around about here. But overall, the direction of travel here does appear to suggest that we're in the process of potentially pushing the boundaries of euro dollar higher. More importantly, cable, I think, has bottomed out. Um, mm -hmm. And that, for me, I think is really a key. What I'm looking for now for the next catalyst is a break of this inverse head and shoulders neckline. We've got the left shoulder here. Colin posted this chart earlier this week, and I talked about it on Tuesday with my weekly video. Um, we've got the right shoulder here. We've got neckline resistance at 144.70. So we could pull all the way back to round about here. But if we break this neckline here, ladies and gentlemen, then you're basically taking the target for this move here all the way up to 151.50 over the course of the next few weeks. So, you know, how does that how does that feed into the Brexit narrative? Now, that's not to say that we're going to, we're going to break out today. I'm not suggesting that for one moment. We can certainly pull all the way back down here. But as long as we stay above 140.80 and then break higher, then there's a good chance that we could go higher. Furthermore, if we look at the monthly chart on, on sterling dollar, it's probably certainly more, a lot more compelling. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll open a completely different chart to illustrate that. That's this chart here. This chart... Here, we posted a bullish engulfing month on the monthly, and that suggests to me that potentially the base is in. Um, we could certainly come all the way back here, but ultimately, as long as we hold above 140.80, then I think there's a good chance we could go back to 150 in, Euro, in, in sterling dollar. And that, again, feeds into my weaker dollar narrative over the long term. So certainly in terms of the dollar trade, I am bearish dollar, irrespective of what the client sentiment indicators are telling me. At the moment, cash is 59% short cable, longer dollars. It's the same sort of story on euro dollar as well. 85% short euros, long dollars. That's pretty much one way. And if we look at dollar yen, and I think I've just about got enough time to do that, this range that we've been in since the middle of February, we can see it here. Good solid support 112. If we get a poor number on the average earnings numbers, then the likelihood is we're probably going to test back to these lows around about 110. So what's going to be a poor number? Well, ultimately, anything between 150 and 250 is going to be broadly neutral. Unemployment rate around about 4.9%, may tick up to 5%. 
is this number here, the average earnings number that we really need to pay attention to. Anything, uh, anything above 0.2%, I think, will probably be mildly dollar positive without, I think, altering the overall direction of the dollar. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it will push it higher, but I don't think it will push it out of the direction that it's in at the moment. A negative number, we could see a test of the highs that we've seen over the course of the last few days. So let's quickly bring it out now. Numbers are now out. 215, 0.3, so that's mildly dollar positive, and 5%, mm -hmm. the unemployment rate's ticked up. So I would suggest that that's mildly dollar positive in the short term, but I don't think it moves the dial much one way or the other with respect to the long-term direction. What it will do is give dollar longs an opportunity to get out. Colin? Yes, I, th I think we, we'll probably see a short-term pop in the uh, in the dollar here off of this, but we'll get intraday fluctuations as we as we move through the day. But what I, I think is most important here with the dollar is that we had a wide discrepancy, and Michael showed it earlier with the WERP and the bonds, is that we've had the bond market forecasting a low number of uh, of interest rate hikes. We had the currency market forecasting a high number of interest rate hikes. Like when it was up at the dollar index was up at 100, you were looking at 4 plus. We're still seeing that reversal back. So we're going to get some short-term trading swings here, and we're getting a little bit of a pop, but this isn't enough to uh, to convince the Fed, to, uh, I don't think, to move up off of uh, off of two rate hikes this year. So we'll get a trading pop, but uh, but I think it'll be fairly short-lived. I think that the the longer-term trend for the uh, the dollar remains downward, and people will, and a certain number of people will probably use this as an opportunity to get out. Yeah, I think so too. And bear in mind, we are at the end of this particular week, and the dollar has been trending down for most of this week. So I think this opportunity here, this will be an ideal opportunity if your long of dollars is to get out. And I think, you know, this, this sort of ties into my narrative. I covered this in my video this week, the dollar index. If we look at this dollar index four-hour chart, what's, not what's notable about this chart, and I think it's borne out certainly here between the 29th of February and the 21st of March, is that whenever we've gone up, whenever, whenever, whenever we see up candles, the up candles are very small and they're fairly incremental. Certainly, if you look at the week beginning the 14th of March, halfway through it, here we've got slowly we're moving higher, moving higher, moving higher. But when we move lower, look at when we move lower, the, the moves are very, very sharp and they're very... They're big pulses. Very, and they're big pulses, exactly. Here and 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 here as well this week. But when we move higher, we move higher incrementally. Or when we move down, we move down aggressively. That suggests to me that the market is longer dollars, but it's nervous of being longer dollars. And when we get a sudden down move, the markets bail. Traders start to bail very, very quickly, and the move becomes self-perpetuating. And we're certainly seeing that, I think, in the context of these moves here and here and here and, and once again here. And actually, if we look at this four-hour chart on – if we look at this four-hour chart here, it's probably not immediately immediately apparent on the four-hour chart, but if we so take it to the five-minute chart, it's, you can see here that we've seen a significant up move. But overall, I think you know we're, we're slap we are slap bang in the middle of this range, and, and we look at this when we look at these peaks here, the peaks are getting lower, the lows are getting lower, and that suggests to me that the trend for the dollar is down. People are still trying to buy into the narrative that the Fed is probably going to be raising rates maybe two or three times this year. I know you and I disagree on this, Colin, and I think that's a good thing because it invites some very healthy debate. Absolutely. But I think that it's going to keep people speculating that we're going to get a June rate rise. And I keep that on the table, and as a result, I think it will keep people trying to buy the dip in the dollar, but ultimately the direction of travel, I think, for the dollar at the moment is towards a slightly weaker one. And I think, I think you know, that that's, that's really borne out by the fact yep. that, you know, this particular dollar-yen move that we were talking about, and, that, and the dollar-yen is very susceptible to dollar strength and dollar weakness, it's not really that impressed. It hasn't been able to get back above the highs of today. And you would expect No, it's it. holding out there around 9470. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm in the dollar index. You go ahead. Yeah, yeah. One twelve forty and on dollar yen. Um, we hasn't really been able to get back above the peaks that we saw first thing this morning. Uh, it's, it's run in to a wall of sellers. So mm. ultimately, that that doesn't bode well for dollar strength in the short to medium term. Obviously, you don't want to read too much into one set of numbers, but I think the market's looked at it and gone, whatever. So. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave us with respect to other currencies? Because I'm sure a whole host of you people will want us to talk about not only um, not not just the main currencies, but also crude oil and gold. Gold's reaction has been fairly muted. So let's have a quick look at that. That's been in a downtrend. This is a four-hour chart that we're looking at at the moment. Um, that's been in a downtrend for most of March. In fact, pretty much all of all of March. But I think it's interesting to note that actually when we sort of zoom it all the way out and we look at where it's come from since the beginning of the year, it's one of the best performing assets. And I think that's as a, as a direct result of the fact that the Fed has gone an awful lot more dovish. And I don't think it's a coincidence that happened. That's happened since the G20 meeting earlier last quarter. And it does, it does strike me, and you may have a view on this, Colin, that central banks are becoming slightly more coordinated in a very subtle fashion. I think they're starting to come back together, and I, I think in particular we're seeing it uh, from the Fed that, um, that I think they've been, every once in a while you'll hear a Fed member uh, talk about negative interest rates, and then they'll quickly downplay it. And I, I think one of the big things the Fed's been trying to do is to, um, to they had become a real outlier, and the dollar had gotten to the point where it actually really was starting to bite into uh, corporate earnings. And, and I think I have the feeling from the Fed that they don't want to be the, to have everybody else uh, devaluing their currencies and, and boosting their economies at the Americans' expense. And I think that they've been trying to come back a, a little bit from, from really hawkish, at least back towards something a little bit more neutral, whereas, mm. and at the same time, they're sending these yeah. warnings out to the other central banks to not go too crazy on, on currency devaluations or, or negative interest rates either. So, yes, as I think we're reaching the limits of where, uh, where the dovish central banks can go with, with negative rates, and in even with QE to a certain extent, I think we're actually getting close to the end of that cycle and that the U.S. is, is leading the way back the other way. And, and that's common. I mean, the U.S. considers, the Fed considers themselves the premier central bank and they expect everyone else to fall into line behind them. And they're starting, but I think they can't go quite as fast as they originally wanted to because they were paying for it in the dollar. But I still think they're trying to uh, kind of push that way. And I think you're right, Michael. We're kind of, we're coming back into the middle on the central banks and we're also slowly coming back into the middle on that divergence we had between uh, between the bonds and the currency, and it's in and the way that's being resolved is by the currency giving way and, and coming back down. Indeed, mate. So let's um let's look at dollar CAD because I know that's one of your favourites. So we'll have a quick look at that because I think you you're arguing that there's a potential for that to have maybe bottomed out. So this is a chart that I drew earlier. Let's look at this the lows from 2014. Look at this line that I've drawn in here, but also look at um, the horizontal line that I've drawn in from these previous peaks all the way over here through the lows in October last year and the lows that we saw earlier this week. And that looks suspiciously like a hammer to me, Colin. Yes. Uh, and it was a uh, it was also a, a bit of a bear trap reversal as well. So I think what we're seeing is that the Canadian dollar is looking a little bit exhausted right now in terms of the move it's had, and and we're probably looking for a bit of an upward correction here in the near term, perhaps back up to that those recent highs of the moving average. Not huge, but I do think that it's probably getting due for a a, a bit of a rest here, and and a lot of that's becoming because we're seeing also that crude oil had had quite a strong rebound, and now it's looking tired and starting to roll over as well. So it's not a, a huge surprise. And interesting, even when we do see the, the crude rolling over, CAD is not falling down as much as others. It's not falling as much as uh, Norway. It's not falling as much as uh, as, as Russia. And, and even the uh, the Canadian economy, because it's a little bit more more sensitive to the U.S. and does does get a bit of a cushion from the fact that the U.S. is doing well, it is has been helping the uh, uh, Canada in that. So, but I do think in the short term you might get a trading a bit of a trading bounce here, and it just because it's uh, it's gotten kind of washed out here.
And also, I think, because oil has topped out. And yeah. I think that's really borne out by this Brent chart here that, that, I, that, I, that I showed you, that, I've, that I have on previous occasions shown people. If we look at the trend line from the May highs last year, look where Brent topped out. Also, look at where it topped out relative to the August lows and the lows mm -hmm. that we saw at the beginning of December. We've also got this this breakout, this triangle breakout from the, the base in earlier this year. We haven't quite hit our target of 44.32, but we've hit this trend line smack on the money. We're coming back down. Crude oil needs to get back below $38 a barrel on the Brent contract. This is the cash contract for the CMC markets contract. If we break below this $38 a barrel, then I think potentially you could argue there's a short-term a short term peak is in and that we could probably come all the way back down to this trend line here and potentially to this um, this, uh, this this series of lows just below 33 around about $32.50. Um, so I'm keeping a very close eye on this on this uh, particular level here around about $38 a barrel. Yes, uh, one other thing, Michael, if you uh, look on the bottom, we've got the stochastics has rolled well under 50, and one of the things this morning on the WTI with the RSI rolled under 50 as well, so you are getting this downward momentum starting to uh, starting to build in, in both crude oil contracts. And if we look at WTI, again, it's a sim I think you can probably see it's a similar sort of story. Not mm -hmm. quite, not quite. Actually, this this one's worked slightly better because we have broken out of this uptrend. But we also, and this is a double bottom breakout, we more or less hit our price target of just over forty-one dollars a barrel. Um, but we weren't able to get back above the two hundred day moving average, which also acted as a little bit of a cap and has acted as a, as a cap since um, since it touch, was touched in June and then again in October. So that's a significant resistance level. We have broken lower. I think the likelihood here is in WTI. The support level is in a slightly different area. It's around about $35 a barrel. But again, it's a similar sort of story when you actually look at it relative to Brent. Okay. I thought there was something that you wanted to add there, Colin, but um, I'm guessing that you didn't. Um, no, we're good. We're good. Okay. So I think um, it was. Let's also have a quick look at um, the Aussie dollar as a bit of a commodities as a bit of a commodities trade. The Aussie dollar's broken to the top side, um, largely I think as a result of dollar weakness. What does that mean going forward? Again. We've got a very significant downtrend line coming in from the 2013 peaks. I think the RBA is going to be very uncomfortable with the prospect of the Aussie dollar heading back towards, and towards 80. And that does appear to be the direction of travel for the Aussie dollar at this point in time. And again, that ties into um, our position of a slightly weaker dollar. Uh, yeah, they've got a meeting next week. I, I'll just uh, RBA has yeah. a meeting next week, so don't with the way this has been acting, don't be surprised if they start taking pod shots and try and talk the dollar down again. The Aussie dollar, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that obviously that could also have significant effects on 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 Aussie yen. But I think I, I think overall, Colin, I think the general consensus that we've taken away from this particular payrolls report is it's a little bit meh. There's not really that much there. To, yeah, it's a steady as she goes kind of number, right down but, the middle of the, yeah. uh, right down the middle. But it, but it's, it's, it, you know, it's slightly, it's not hawkish, it's not dovish. The unemployment rate's ticked up, but so is the participation rate. So you could argue that there is a correlation between those two. But but overall, I think we're pretty much done in terms of price movements for today. Um, yes, we have ISM manufacturing out later. Um, this afternoon, um, and that may cause a little bit of a reaction, um, certainly in terms of the of, of what we're expecting from the market. And we'll have a quick we'll we'll do a brief summary of that. We've not only got U.S. Man, ISM manufacturing PMIs, but we've also got Canadian PMIs. Um, yep. I would expect the Canadian PMIs to improve back above 50 
given the GDP so. number we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. Was it yesterday or was it the day before? I can't remember now. Uh, it, was it, was this, it was this. It was this. Yeah, it was this week. And then we've yeah. got the ISM, and that was forty nine point five. In and the street's expecting that to tick back above fifty two. Yeah, I think it might go 51 or 52. I think, again, that will be slightly more dollar positive in the short term, and I think that could potentially um, push euro a little bit lower. And, oh, and one uh, more. Yeah. Keep an eye on, uh, on construction spending as well, because that had a big pop in February, and that was that weather effect because the winter mm -hmm. wasn't so bad this year. So, again, that's another one of was uh, with some of the construction spending pulled forward because February wasn't so bad, and yet the street is looking for a bit of a retrenchment in March. So let's see what happens with that. Okay. All right, so um, I think we're pretty much uh, done for this month. Um, hopefully you've um, got something from this webinar. If you have any questions, please fire them my way now. Um, otherwise, we will post this on YouTube, and um, um, we'll post it on YouTube, and hopefully it will be available by the end of today, and you can listen to it back. Otherwise, thanks very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. And Colin and I will talk to you probably the same time next month for the main on-farm payrolls. And we may well actually do a preview of the FOMC meeting sometime towards the end of April. But we'll let you know about that nearer the time. Uh, we've got one question, Michael. Uh, yeah, why is a weak dollar good? Is it because it increases spending? So I'll speak to that. Uh, yeah. The weaker dollar helps the American companies in two ways. First of all, it helps their exports, it makes their exports expensive abroad, and that's one of the things that's hurt them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the other thing it does for them is when their corporate earnings come back, particularly from overseas, and of course, the U.S. is headquarters to a lot of global multinationals, And but when their, uh, their overseas earnings come back and the dollar's higher, they come back at a lower level. So a lot of companies have been talking over the last uh, year, uh, in particular, of the, they've had a, the, the negative foreign exchange impact on their earnings because the U.S. dollar soared in between uh, mid 2014 and, and mid 2015. It went it went from 80 to 100. It was a huge, huge rally in the U.S. dollar, and it did have a seriously negative impact on U.S. corporate earnings and and U.S. corporate exports. So, uh, as it starts to come back down in this case, it's what they call taking some of the pressure off of them. Some of the negative headwinds to corporate earnings that we've seen are starting to go away. As as, as the weaker dollar comes off. So, and I mean, certainly other countries have been out there uh, driving down their currencies to help to uh, rebalance and, and boost their economies. So a, a falling dollar does help the, the U.S. In fact, we can say that often a rising currency in general is the same thing as, a, as interest rate increases. It does provide the, uh, the same kind of effect. A falling currency has the same uh, positive effect as interest rate cuts. Cool. Great. Okay. Well, if there's unless there's anything else, thank you, Colin. And no problem. Thank, thank you, you Michael. Thank, thank, and thank you, everybody else. And, Thanks, everybody. Um, we'll um, we'll uh, talk to you again either later this month or um, first thing in May. Thanks a lot. Yes. Have a great day trading, everybody, and a nice weekend.